Ah, another draft physics video presentation. Uh, this one on the subject of magnetism. Uh, we won't bother with comments, but there's only a couple, so we'll save them for some other comment video. And just do kind of a regarding video. Um, this is some new guy I found. Uh, just started publishing these videos. Uh, Sean Carney. Uh, anyway, um maybe we can get a provoke some sort of response back who knows uh, he seems to know his physics uh, in the conventional sense and I'll just point out where the conventional sense is just so close but they just missed <laughs> you know the obvious almost uh, it says plus and minus thing getting the plus and minus thing wrong kind of thing they just did they did that more than once you know in terms of just getting something backwards and getting the relationship between electricity and char charge and magnetism, they just kind of got it backwards um, in terms of understanding that the only thing that's different about a, um, magnetism uh, is the fact that the monopoles of uh, electricity are essentially um, the dipole that is a magnet. And they keep claiming there's no magnetic monopoles <clears throat> when it seems kind of obvious that that's exactly what electrons and protons are because if you put electrons on one side of an atom and the protons on the other side of the atom you have the thing okay the atom um, that makes magnets I mean that's how magnets are made <laughs> so it just seems kind of you know they're arguing against their own theory in a sense to even argue that somehow um, the atoms aren't where the magnets being created and that the process is merely to have more electrons on one side than the other side. But whatever. They think this moving thing has something to do with it. You don't need to move the electron. I mean, move it in the sense that all you need to do is change the relationship between the electron and the proton, and you've changed its polarity, or its um, whether it's more positive or negative, uh, whether it's magnetic. But anyway, so let's play along, and I'll point out where it all goes wrong. Now, first of all, there are only three magnetic elements. So it's, bad news is, it's uh, it's not very good quality video, and I have it sped up. And so the thing is, I don't know whether he's like doing homeschooling or something, so he just videos drawing, which is fine, and talking. Um, but again, the quality isn't too good, and he's obviously talking, soliciting answers from some students, but uh, there's no background here so I can't say how or why he's doing this iron cobalt and nickel. so iron cobalt and nickel are the only th materials that become magnetic in that they dramatically change their atomic structure when in proximity to a magnetic field um, and they're the ones that when yeah, that's about it. Um, you know, and they're, you could argue that they're also paramagnetic, uh, not only just ferro or cobalt or whatever magnetic, but the, they're magnetic in other senses. It's just that this one is so dramatic and that their atoms are already polarized and all they have to do is line up to make them magnetic. So it's, they could be sort of viewed as having atoms that are already, um, uh, have a polarization, an angle, and all you're doing is unrandomizing them and having them all line up the same way to create a magnet. Iron, cobalt, and nickel are the only magnetic atoms. And before we, uh, I put further into basically how magnets work. Um, I want to know some background. So, <clears throat> he's really not going to explain how magnets work. He's going to explain effects again, not really causes. Which, you know, is the game conventional physics plays. They pretend they're going to tell you why it happens, but they're really not. They're just going to tell you what happens, which you can observe for yourself. Information. What kind of explanation of magnets could a second grader give me? kinds of things about magnets with a second grader no opposite effect so, <sighs> so instead of just doing this you know in a efficient concise way yeah he's doing it the hard way 
uh, instead of just listing the properties magnets have uh you know this kind of crap uh, we've got what else would a spectator be able to tell me they must do it for a reason that's what they could possibly speculate and that you should be explaining the reason why do opposites attract and why do likes repel Um, that's not entirely accurate. No, it's not. She probably was misinformed. So you can't hear what uh, he's saying. So, and, uh, so somebody said something, he's saying the person who told him so is misinformed. And, you know, and I would argue that he's been misinformed, <laughs> you know. Okay, they can wipe that off the hard drive. Probably parents, when you start bringing your magnets over to your computer and trying to place them on it. All right, anything else? How about like poles repel? Like poles repel? No, though that's literally the opposite of that. <laughs> Okay. And I'll put on here that I think it's very that. I couldn't hear what he said, so we'll have to wait till he draws it. Magnets can that's erase. Fine, don't get distracted. Oh, that's boring. And all right. So beyond this, we want to have a little bit more understanding for what actually drives magnets. Um, to dive into that, though, I want you to go ahead and take your toys out of the pot. And you're going to place one neatly on your notes or on a piece of paper. Okay. Uh, the other toy you should have. So, sorry, this will be a little tedious in places, apparently. Even though I have it sped up, I need to speed it up even more in places. So, this is the north side over here and the south side over here and such. Is a compass. Okay. So first of all, hold your compass up and far away from literally anything else, especially magnets. Right. <clears throat> so this is where they start to go all wrong, is they don't recognize that a compass is a magnet, and that's all it is. So instead of calling it a compass, they should just make sure they call it a compass magnet or a magnus compass or something. A, uh, a magnet being used as a compass, uh, a, a, a pivoting magnet. So that's all it is, is another magnet. And it's going to do what another magnet would do in the case of opposite poles attract and like poles repel. So if you know those two things, then you can understand that whatever this is expelling has to be something attractive to the north side. And whatever this is expelling has to be repulsive to the south side. And if you just do that figuring, that there's a certain amount of repulsion to one end of the other magnet, that the two magnets will interact coherently, perfectly coherent with these two little principles. Opposites attract, like poles repel, there. Perfectly consistent with that. The compass needle will arrange itself, the other magnet will arrange itself with that principle. Um, and one of the two needles is going to point that way. Mine's kind of off to the side a little bit. And one is going to point that way. The needle, oh wow, my Okay, so this is the type of needle. So, needle looks like that. This is the type of needle. Some of them may have the red one pointing up here. It doesn't really matter which is pointing to the north, um, because the way they get stored in this fashion is uh, see, he moves away from the microphone, I guess, so the audio blinks out, and so he isn't saying anything terribly important. He's, I guess, helping them align their magnet on a piece of paper. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so I'll do a little stuff while he's getting to the point. So just be aware that you may not have the same orientation magnet as your neighbor. So mine, the white arrow points... White arrow? Yeah, the white arrow is pointing towards the north, so it is the end pole magnet. All I'm going to do is I'm just going to set it down next to my, my, mag, to my larger magnet, and I'm going to use it to find the direction um, that the magnetic field is pointing at different points. And I'm just going to lift up the compass and draw an arrow in the direction of the end pole of my compass. Right, so he's doing this cliche kind of thing of saying that because the two magnets line up, that is if I put another little magnet here, right, a little baby magnet next to this big magnet, it'll obviously line up exactly opposite because if you just thought about it as being these repulsive forces, that is the rays coming off of this, okay, are going to hit both of these objects and it's going to be repulsive to this one and attractive to this one. So this one wants to get closer, but this one wants to get further away. And both of those, so like if this was the only thing in the picture, okay, you could say, well, yeah, this little, the little red bit's going to swing this way, the black bit's going to swing towards, and it's going to point right at that charge. But since I have another one right next to it doing exactly the same thing, okay, um, you know, doing this repulsive, attractive thing, uh, <clears throat> then that's going to completely balance that out. Because if I take this out of the picture, you could see that this one wants to push that one this way, and it wants to push this one this way, just the opposite. And so the balance is going to be, it's going to line up even this way, because the two forces are going to balance each other out. So the repulsion to the black end is going to be balanced out by the repulsion to the red end, and the attraction to the black end is going to be balanced out for between the attraction to the red. And that's all. And so all your magnet's doing is lining up with this field created around each one of these objects. And these fields, the field has a character. It's obviously producing something. This magnet's producing something. This pole of the magnet is producing something all right <laughs> and it's um obviously depending on what i put here it's going to be repulsive or it's going to be attractive yeah. and that's it and if i have something that's tied together if i tie these two little fellas together well they're going to have to line up just like a magnet lines up which is they're going to spray a bunch of you know, straight lines here and then the lines are going to start to go like this and the magnet's going to line up opposite the original magnet. Not complicated at all, really. At various different locations. I'm going to do this, I don't know, several times. But go ahead, take a moment, draw some arrows indicating the direction that the compass points when it's around your magnet at various locations. tedious but whatever um, so again this will end up being what they're going to try to imply is because magnets line up this way this one's balanced and this one will be a little tilted this way and it'll tilt more and it'll tilt more and so this ends going to all the little magnets will line up kind of straight because they're seeing a lot of this force but very little of this force and vice versa at this end and the rest of them will just line up proportional to um, the fact that they're getting exposure to both the repulsive and the attractive end and the more balanced the exposure the more parallel they'll be to the other magnet and the less balanced it is the less parallel they'll be but there's absolutely no indication that there's any flow of anything in this direction there's just an indication that as a charge just as a charge would act if I put two charges next to each other and then I made a, an electric dipole, that is, I made a, an atom that's polarized, that atom will line up <clears throat> just like this, and when it does line up, it's going to be a magnet, a little magnet. You put a bunch of little magnets together, you get a big magnet. So it's just wrong to think of these as anything other than 
charges and a, when you make the charges into a dipole you created a magnet that's it Sorry, I didn't think he didn't say anything. I don't remember the not saying anything part. I was drawn at this point. Um, where have you seen something similar to this? Right, the electric fields. All right, so he says, right, the electric fields. Let's understand, this is what Maxwell drew, and I guess the other guy, Faraday, I think. All right, would be a charge, and the charge radiates okay lines of force all right and the way you tell the strength of the charge like whether this is a one charge or a two charge or a three charge is you just measure how strong it is out here and all the met strength would be is more lines so <clears throat> over here if you were to put an object at this distance it'll intersect you know these three four lines here will all intersect with it and the rest won't but if i put it out here only two of these lines will intersect with it. If I put it even further away, okay, only one of the lines will intersect with it. And that's the inverse square law, essentially. So it's a radial force drawn by Maxwell. That's how Maxwell will draw the lines of force. Now the field lines are just where, say, the strength is you get hit by three of the lines at this location. So you get hit by three lines here. You get hit by three lines here, and you get hit by three lines here. And so the field lines are just the drawing of where is their three strength. And you just draw that line. Now, if I put another charge in here, all right, then it gets more complicated because now you're getting hit by other lines. These would be attractive lines. So these are repulsive lines to a negative charge. These would be attractive to a negative charge. And so this number, this uh, space, just does the addition. It says I'm getting three pluses, you know, pulls towards, and I'm getting two pushes away, so that would be a five. And so now this location would be a five, not a three. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't draw a three line through there. A three line would have to go in here somewhere. So now you've changed the field lines. But you didn't change the lines of force. The lines of force are these lines. And if you draw those off a magnet, as if you draw a dipole using the same lines, you'll get the image of the field lines around a magnet. It's, <laughs> there's no difference. So I, I like this guy, if he wants to respond to me at all, just explain how electrons and protons don't perfectly fit the definition of magnetic monopoles. If you had a definition for a magnetic monopole, what it should look like, how would it look any different than an electron and a proton? How are they not perfectly suited to the title magnetic monopole? How do they fail to be magnetic monopoles? So what we've just done is we've mapped the magnetic field. Just like gravity, electricity, Magnetism is also a field force. Right, and you can do the same thing with gravity, and that's essentially what Einstein did <coughs> in terms of creating bent space or a bent geodesic. Um, isn't it pretty much the same thing as this? Just saying that imagine where the lines are closer, that that's deeper in the well. So he's doing a topographical kind of way of looking at it. So if I was to try to illustrate uh, a well in a, f a flat drawing, Maybe I'd illustrate it by having lines that converge. And so this is exactly what you'd expect somebody to draw for the lines of force for gravity also. Same, same image, no different. And all you're doing is measuring the strength at different distances by how many of these lines intersect you. And you kind of have to know that, well, those lines are spreading this way and they're also spreading that way. <coughs> And that's the inverse square part. That's the R squared is recognizing that it's doing it in both dimensions. The lines are separating in both dimensions. Because this is a sphere, not a circle.
And just like electric field, we have a few different rules for action. Right, so if you were to do uh, mock gravity, then you'd be thinking of this field of force. Now, he says here, magnetism is a field force. It would be better just to say it's a field of force. Okay, there's no, there's no force without the field, and all you're really measuring, though, in a field is like where you have a magnet next to another magnet there's places where there's balance in the field it doesn't mean there's no pressure there's no field there's no influence it just means that the two influences attraction and repulsion are balanced so if i put something in between two charges there'll be a balanced position between those two charges and everything and gravity does the same thing if i put something between the moon and the earth at a certain location it'll experience zero force. Well, there's not that there's no gravity on the moon anymore, and it's not that the earth stopped having gravity. It's just that the two forces, the pull towards the moon and the pull towards the earth, have been balanced, and therefore the thing experiences no obvious effect of the change in the field. So the field is something you can argue um, can be augmented. It can be reduced or increased, uh, changed in its polarity, uh, it can be more red, more positive, or more negative, um, and that that will change where that position of balance would be between two objects. Drawing out an electric field. So first of all, I'm going to play a little bit of connect the arrows with these and map out some electric fields. So some electric fields, he said. It's a magnet. <laughs> these aren't electric pathways. Nothing is following these directions. Those arrows only represent, that's because he chose to say one end means this and one end means that. Well, that only is in the, in the circumstance where you're moving the magnet to induce a current in an electric wire. You'll induce the current based on positive and negative. Which end is positive and which end is negative? Which end is south and which end is north? Representing protons or electrons. Um, <clears throat> And so obviously there would be a, a connection um, to a direction because obviously one end's going to push electrons and one end's going to attract electrons, meaning you're going to have a different direction in the current of electricity so that you're going to induce. And so there's a rule that one end's going to be pushing electrons and one end will be pulling them, but there's no there's absolutely no evidence of anything moving around, any current, any motion, any force, any anything moving around a magnet. And everybody knows this. I mean, everybody knows that if I just put a static magnet somewhere, there's not a single thing I can put in the field that will um, keep moving around one of these circles, be pushed by any of these swirly forces. I can't I can't find the swirly force with any uh, device, any, any elemental particle. None of them will ever illustrate to me that there's any energy in the magnetic field except the radiation that causes repulsion and attraction. There's nothing moving in a direction beyond that. Let's go around in there. Let's go out like that this around and like that okay just kind of showing generic directions that these electric or sorry magnetic field lines would follow right so let's understand at one end the north end those lines are going to get pretty straight coming out and they're, so they're going to have huge arcs if they were to have an arc but the only part of the arc the only reason why it's arcing is because they're measuring it with a dipole another magnet and you're just measuring the balance of the force how much say if one end was red and one end is black in terms of what force it's producing you can understand that more black is going to hit it than red is going to hit it and it's going to tilt in a certain way depending on the balance of how much force is hitting the magnet and so it's just doing this it's just telling you which way a magnet will orient itself to the pressure based on the fact that its two poles are feeling the pressure exactly opposite to the two poles of the magnet so, first of all, when we drew electric field lines, what were some of the rules for drawing electric field lines? All right, so he calls them electric field lines, but what he's actually saying right now are lines of force. 
So to draw these lines, these round lines, you first have to draw these lines. These are the lines of force that Maxwell used to illustrate the position of these lines. <clears throat> so he's calling this line and this line, he's calling them the same thing and they're not the same thing. One are the lines of force and one is the field strength, the field lines. And they're not the same thing in any respect. One is um, <clears throat> almost arbitrary in its position, and the other one is completely, I mean, arbitrary in the sense you just change the test charge's strength and you'll change where the line will be. And the other is a, um, a definite proportional way to measure the exact strength of the uh, magnet or the charge. Play. Oh, he is playing. Okay. So the number of lines had to be proportional to the charge of the, uh, well, the electric charge. Whether right. So the number of lines, okay, he just said it, right? But those lines weren't these kind of lines. Those lines were radial lines. So if he had drawn radial lines off the north end and radial lines off the south end, those would have been the same as the electric. Um, force, lines of force, and how many of those lines you intersect would tell you the strength of the field. The further away I go, the less lines that will go through me. The closer I get, the more lines that will go through me. The more rays, just like a light bulb, just like the sun. It's a straight line radial force, clearly, decisively it was protons or electrons. Okay, we could either do that by how many arrows there were, or how long the arrows were, or the opacity. There were a few different uh, options. But in one way or another, the lines had to be proportional to the electric charge. Here, number of lines or strength of lines, opacity of lines, is somehow proportional to the magnetic field strength. <clears throat> Which it really isn't okay it's proportional to the field the strength of the material you're using to measure them the strength of the little magnets you're measuring with so if you use really tiny uh, bits of fer ferrite um, to to do your seeing of the lines the lines will be in a different position than if you use big pieces so if you use bigger magnets those lines will end up being different locations because you're the, the dipole you're measuring with is just as integral to the measurement as the thing producing the magnetic field. The little bits of iron that are going to be magnetized are just as real as magnets and they're changing the field strength of the interaction. So the bigger the magnet you use, the more and the further apart the lines will be. Because again, as I pointed out, you can just think of this as a, uh, an obvious the thing he's not drawing here is that the polarity of these of those lines of the the little iron filings or the compass needles are lining up in the opposite direction and at each one of those positions the compass needles lining up in the opposite in the opposite alignment so all of the compass needles if those were all compass needles and you left them there to create your field lines all of them would be repelling each other because they'd all have like same polarity and so they all have the same polarity the lines and they're the lines are all opposite polarity to the magnet that induced the magnetism in the ferrite the lines are proportional to magnetic field so I'd, I'd say that's just wrong because the the lines, these lines are not proportional. The lines that are proportional are the ones that create these lines. That is the strength of the radial lines. That's what these are proportional to and therefore they're only proportional to the strength of the magnet based on the fact that 
the underlying field lines, lines of force, were the ones that created those lines. What else did we have for electric field lines? Two other rules. What were they? They couldn't cross. Immediately. It's all straight line radial force, so obviously they can't cross. So if you think of the rays of the sun or something, they can't cross. Um, they actually do in the sense that one side of the sun, each, each element of the sun is producing lines. And so in a sense they do cross, but all the crossing cancels out because it's a sphere. So, you know. So he's saying they can't cross, but technically they do cross. Now these lines um, wouldn't cross because they're the byproduct of the lines that actually created these lines. So again, the, the radial lines are the ones creating these lines. So he's one step above getting to the elemental function, where he's talking elemental functions with charge. He understands the radial lines coming out of the charge to create the field lines and yet he's not accounting for anything creating these field lines. Magnetic field lines can't cross. Cannot cross. And lastly, <laughs> okay, so for electric field lines, they started at positive charges or infinity, and ended at negative charges or infinity. So this is where you just get the point that obviously this round line doesn't end in infinity. So when he's saying the field lines, he means the lines of force. These lines begin at the charge and end in infinity. They just keep going. Uh, technically, they spread so much that, you know, 99% of infinity will never see one of them. <laughs> you know, but anyway, um, or you could think of them going in as attraction or repulsion, but obviously you can understand that the lines come from the charges. And it's that the lines coming from this charge attracted the object, the line, and a red object, and the same lines repel a black object. So you really know that it's the lines that are always coming from and out, and it just depends on whether it's attraction or repulsion. So he's thinking they come from infinity and saying that, you know, he's trying to turn them into lines coming in when, no, they're obviously lines coming out, reflecting. They did go in to, to be created because that's because the initial energy comes from the exterior world and the two objects just end up reflecting one color and diverting the other, as I pointed out in previous videos numerous times. For magnets, it's almost identical. It's just that there is no infinity option. They start at <laughs> n poles. And right, so again, he's, he's just clearly confusing lines of force with field lines. <clears throat> They're not the same thing. One's a byproduct of the other. And in describing magnets, he's just throwing away the elemental principle, which is you have to explain what the radiation is that's causing the effect, and he doesn't have it in there. <laughs> He's thrown out the function of a magnet, um, which is obviously this straight line radial force coming out of both ends. And at S poles. Magnetic field lines. Start at and end at so, so you can understand how this is just a clear error, right? I mean, he's saying these, the, the other lines go from the charge to affinity, so clearly they're ones radiating. And then, and we know that, yes, you can you can draw a circle around the radiating lines where the charge is all equal and it'll be the same shape as the object for which is creating the lines. So we know what those lines are. <clears throat> for an electric field, we know that the lines, the field lines, are not the same as the lines of force that create them. And here he's clearly 
equating the two. He's, he's using lines of force to explain a charge, and then he's using field lines to explain magnetism. And that's just wrong. Okay. Um, one of the big ramifications of this is that there are no singular poles for magnetism. They so it's just kind of ludicrous. <laughs> I mean, I, I would argue because there's just no way you can say an electron and a proton aren't the single poles of magnetism. Exactly how you make a magnet is to separate the electrons from the protons in an atom and make it polarized. And that polarization, when you line all the magnets, up, all the atoms up like that, you end up with a magnet. And that's just the way magnets are made. It seems clear there. There's no other explanation. It is monopoles. It is the charge that doesn't have a dipole. Charge doesn't make dipoles. Yeah. You know, the 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 two poles that attract never. You know, you could argue that north and south, when they come, I'm just saying, if I take an electron and a proton, put them next to each other, and keep them static, you can see it's a magnet. <laughs> it can't be anything. It can't be called anything else. So it's just a, a pointless statement um, made for um, the only reason it exists as a statement is because Maxwell made the mistake of thinking there's two different kinds of fields, an electric field and a magnetic field, and there's no such thing. <clears throat> Electricity, okay, is a phenomenon where atoms transfer pressure between each other. Electricity happens in conductors made of atoms. Electricity doesn't happen without the existence of atoms. So that's one phenomenon. And the phenomenon of charge, that is the having polarization, you know, plus and minus, um, that's the foundation of magnetism. It isn't the foundation of electricity. The foundation of electricity requires you to have dipoles, full atoms, all right, that you can transfer the pressure between. You can make one positive, one negative, and they'll, they'll, they'll just keep exchanging their pressure, their positive or negative value. So they're not, you know, they're not <coughs> two different fields. They're, it's always the same force, um, and the force just has to do with positive and negative, north and south, same difference. Um, and the fact that the radiation from positive objects is affects negative objects in an inverse way to how it affects positive objects. Always come in pairs. For electricity, we can have an electric monopole. It's called a proton or an electron. For magnetism, they simply don't exist. So again, just simply, it doesn't make any sense at all to say. So again, we have to have a polarized atom to um, allow you to find a difference, to create a voltage. You have to sit there and make something more positive or more negative so you're creating an imbalanced magnet essentially a magnet that has one big pole and one small little tiny pole so it's just taking dipolarity and not having it balanced where a magnet has balanced polarity there's just as much north as there is south there's nothing else happening and part of the reason for that is magnetism is more like a direction than a charge so this is the big mistake. There's absolutely no evidence that it's a direction. There's no evidence that those little arrows mean anything in terms of anything flowing through those lines at all. There's zero evidence ever found that a magnet can move anything just sitting there, that there's anything flowing around it, that there's any wind that it's creating any circulation whatsoever. There's just zero evidence. The only way you can induce a current is to move the magnet itself you can't do it by just sitting the magnet next to it and just saying, do your stuff, magnet, and make energy. It can't do it. So, Meaning, um, simply an N-pole or an S-pole. Magnets that are... So again, the S-pole and the N-pole act exactly like charges. There's absolutely no difference in how they act. 
the one end acts just like it was a proton, the other end acts just like it was an electron, and they were stuck together, and they'll create exactly the same line. So if I take an actual electron and a proton, a ch pieces of charge, a one charge of positive and a one positive of negative, and I smash the two together, there's absolutely no difference between that thing and a magnet. That's a magnet. Just N or S do not exist. Okay. So, so again, they obviously do exist. It's just you can't possibly have a dipole if you don't have both of them. So, I mean, it's that simple. I mean, you can you can't have magnetism made out of monopoles. That is north pole over here and south pole way over here. You can't make a magnet that way. So what magnetism doesn't have is, yes, obviously something can't be both a monopole and a dipole. So that's kind of obvious. So if you're going to call something a different name, fine. But just understand that magnets are made of monopoles. So it's stupid to say there's no magnetic monopoles because obviously a magnet's a dipole, north and south and the monopoles are north and south and north and south is exactly like positive and negative. If I take a positive and negative and shove them right next to each other again, I have a magnet. If I take an electron and a proton and shove them next to each other, I have a magnet. When we're thinking about magnetism more as a direction and less of as like a charge, one of the things I want to point out is that it's a continuous direction. So if I take my so again, it's there's nothing continuous. There's no energy. There's no force moving in any direction. This is all just made up, um, and it just has to do with the fact that yes, magnets are oriented. One side is electron, one side is proton. If you move one end in, you'll push away the electrons. If you move that end in the opposite direction, you'll push the electrons in the opposite direction. So obviously the orientation will dictate which way an electron will move in a wire. Obviously. But that's all these arrows represent. What side of the magnet pushes electrons? That's all it's showing you. That's all those arrows are indicating. What side of this magnet will push electrons? And what side will pull them? Hmm. Appear to pull. Learn from up above. And I just continue these lines through my magnet. We find that we actually create magnetic loops that go inside the magnet from S to N and then outside from N to S, making a continuous uh, loop. Yeah, there's no such thing again. There's no evidence for any movement, any current inside the magnet, any such thing happening. All the magnet is is a filter for energy coming from the exterior world. And all the, the exterior energy comes in is mixed, electron and proton force, black and red force lines. And the magnet merely reflects all the black ones at one end, it reflects all the red ones at the other end, and it diverts appropriately the wrong colors. And therefore it segregates, it cleans, it filters the force that comes in. So the force of gravity, the mixed force, hits it and it merely segregates the two forces. Period. End. It's problem solved. Uh, energy explained. Energy has to come from the outside because obviously the magnet doesn't get lighter just like the earth doesn't get lighter as it produces gravity. <laughs> the force comes from the outside. And this is because magnetism is caused by motion. On some fundamental level, in all situations, magnetism has to do with motion of electric charge. Right, and so this is their misunderstanding. They obviously are figuring out that they have to come up with this energy, and they're not recognizing that the motion can't be from inside because there's no evidence of it from inside. There's no evidence of any energetic exchange of momentum. There's no evidence that even heating up a magnet makes it more magnetic. It obviously it makes it less magnetic. That there's no way to energize the magnet. Um, and so this is just illogical. The function of the magnet is merely the fact that it becomes a filter. It's filter paper. It's not doing anything active. 
it's a passive um, mechanism and all the energy comes from the exterior. Now what that motion is exactly it can vary. We'll talk a lot uh, next week about electromagnetism and how you build an electromagnet and then we'll build an electromagnet. Right, and all an electromagnet is doing is, is as you move uh, current, you're basically depolarizing and polarizing magnets, I mean uh, atoms. You're, you're changing them from being more positive than negative to more negative than positive by changing their the amount of air in them, the amount of fluid, the amount of stuff, the amount of force. And um, as you do that, you're making them into magnets. You're polarizing the material because it goes from, there's it's full of pieces that are um, divergent in their polarity. That is one is, it's one right next to another one. One here has um, high pressure and then this one has low pressure and then they share their pressure and then this one has high pressure again and this one has lower pressure so they're magnet again. So they go to being neutral but most of the time in the interaction of electricity passing through they keep switching and as they're switching they're going from being they're, they're a magnet, then they're off, then they're a magnet, then they're off, then they're a magnet, then they're off. So they keep polarizing the material, that is, they keep turning the atoms into little magnets by changing the position of the electrons. Um, but in terms of making a permanent magnet, it relies on what we call so this is another complete error in description um, to go to domains. So again, just as he's not getting that the the magnet, the origin of the field lines is the lines of force, the energy, the force lines, just as he's ignoring that by jumping to domains, he's basically ignoring, again, the obvious indication you're getting. Um, <clears throat> that the magnet does have polar monopoles um, by talking about domains. So here I have a substance. Domains merely mean you have areas in this substance and these areas would be where magnets would be all lined up in one direction and domains can line up in various directions. Um, you know, the little magnets inside of them. So the magnets we know to be compatible with each other for for one magnet to sit next to another magnet. Uh, I'm going to do it over here, I guess. For one magnet to sit next to another magnet, we know that those magnets will have to be arranged. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Um, so that that, so they're compatible. So their attractive ends and their repulsive ends are compatible with each other. So the, this force holds them tighter together, so they're not repelling each other. So that the like forces are as far apart from each other um, and the opposite forces are close to each other. So this is how the magnet will have to be lined up inside of the material, is always opposite, and so these are what domains do. So domains are an organization of all the material and essentially the real um, magnet here is here. So you can understand that this is the real magnet. So the surface would lack this end. So now you can see that if I just stagger the magnets, then they do the right alignment, plus to plus, I mean opposites for the attraction, um, and they'll just keep lining up that way and so that all the magnets will be essentially pointing in the same direction. And so if this is true that this black force would reflect and that a red force would be deflected, you can understand that the red force is going to keep going up this way, the black force is going to keep going down this way, and the object, <laughs> the domain itself, will be reflecting a bunch of black this way, producing it when the field energy comes in, it'll produce a lot of black going one way and a lot of this red force going the opposite way, a higher proportion 
And then if I line up all these domains, that is all the domains end up being lined up the same way instead of different ways, then this whole material becomes a magnet. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it happens. So again, is bring up domains when they're the emergent property. Domains are emergent from the lining up of the atoms. And so if he would have just gotten to atoms and the electrons and protons to start with, then he would have a proper lineage of the magnetic domains. The new magnetic domains start with electrons and protons, then they start with the arrangement of the electrons and protons and all the atoms in the same symmetry, same red ends pointing the right way. Um, and then you just have a matter of moving all, having all the domains pointing the same way. The concept behind domain theory is that a magnet is made of a bunch of mini magnets. So if I take my magnetic bar and I break it into a whole bunch of groups that tend to the pattern, um, grouping maybe a centimeter in diameter, each of these groups of atoms is called a domain. A group of atoms is called a domain. Within that domain, all the electrons have spin. I just See, most metals are crystals, and so most of the things that get magnetic are crystals. And crystals tend to have breaks in them and impurities, and that's where lines will break. And so the structure will be able to be, the crystal can grow this way, or the crystal can grow with an orientation this way. And the bottom line is, is that these, these planes of crystal have the capacity to have their atoms reorient. So the domains can change their orientation based on the atoms turning inside of the crystal lattice. Just put giant air quotes around that if you didn't see, so they all have spin. Now the re reason I'm doing that is because when we originally started understanding magnetism, we believed that the electrons were in fact spinning. So this is just more, he's conceding that spin doesn't mean spin anymore. And the whole idea of spin really means that electrons rotate around protons, so they've really you know, changed something spinning into something rotating or orbiting and calling that electron spin um, because they have to create this magnetic moment where the atom is a, for a moment, the electron and the proton are in the right al alignment and there's no moment about it. Um, the fact is it's either on or off. Uh, the, the magnetic moment can be five hours long or the magnetic moment can be a second or a millisecond or a tenth of a hundred or millionth of a second depending on how much voltage or how much current is moving through something with electricity. Um, that will tell you how often you're turning the magnet on and off. But there's no, there's no electron spin, there's no, um, I mean it's just not true. And this is all based on Stern-Gerlach which is a, an experiment with um, silver atoms and the fact that the silver atoms which are dipoles okay they're basically little magnets and when you shove them at a high velocity through a unbalanced magnetic field that they'll do fluky things they'll go either they'll end up going this way or they'll go this way but they won't go this way okay it's just not miraculous at all and has nothing to do with electrons um, it has to do with atoms that are dipoles. Uh, an electron can't have a moment. An electron is always the same charge, is always a monopole, is always that. It is never a dipole. It can never be turned on or off. And the same is for the proton. Um, they're elementarily what they are. They don't change at all. And all you can change is their distance from each other and change their orientation in a group and then you can make something magnetic or you can make something mixed. Obviously if I take a bunch of magnets and I turn them all different ways, I'll completely undo any magnetic field that might exist because I'll be doing, you know, just, it's the same thing as doing this, you know, just having a red end of the magnet and a black end of the magnet. 
um, pointing the same way. You know, I mean, if I had a, especially if I could make them into triangles or something, well, that's a bad example, actually. So if I had two magnets and I have the red end <coughs> and the black end, I mean, obviously I'm going to undo, you know, at, at this location, far enough away that it's going to be a neutral field. This is going to be just as much black as there is red energy hitting. So there's going to be just as much repulsion as there is attraction. All right. But if I, you know, orient it so all the red ends are facing one end, blah, 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 uh, the whole thing becomes a magnet. All right. In a specific direction, and the direction that they were spinning caused the magnetic field. We've come to find out that, yeah, no, that's not how it works. Um, <coughs> But we right, but you would have told everybody before you found that out that that is how it works, just as you're telling people how it works now, when you don't really know how it works. So you're just saying this stuff because you think it, and um, you have, in my opinion, really no good reason to think it, and you've premised it on something obviously that you never really thought about, which is why aren't electrons and protons magnetic monopoles? If I want to make a magnet, I need electrons and protons to make one. Quite obviously, they seem to be the constituent of the magnet. They're the whole reason why there is a magnet is because the atoms have electrons and protons, and the electrons are pointing one way, and the protons are pointing the other way. There's no other reason for there to be a magnet. Stuck with the term spin because we had nothing better, so we just ran with it. Yeah, right. So exactly, and that's funny. When now it's really kind of serious, especially when you're mocking any other person who suggests you might be wrong about something and that your physics isn't perfect. Your claim all these things are true with such um, um, arrogance, and um, you have such a hostility to any discussion about these elemental functions and your elemental presumptions. And yet you make a joke about the fact, well, we just do it this way because, you know, it's fun. Yeah. It might be complete garbage. You're conceding it might be garbage as a theory. Um, and yet you're unwilling to even have a discussion about your um, foundational elemental understanding of the fields involved. You're certain Einstein's right. Why are you certain? Okay. So in that domain, in a domain, all the electrons have the same magnetic spin. Oh, electrons. So again, it doesn't make any sense. The electrons have the same magnetic spin. The electron is a charge. It doesn't have a dipole. It can't have a magnetic spin. It can't be red and black. It can't do any of that stuff. So it's just silly. It's just conceptual rubbish. Uh, the same magnetic spin. Which, running with the concept of direction, the whole spinning thing was really nice because if you're spinning in one direction, you're going to generate an end pole in one direction. If you're a dipole, but how can an electron do that, right? So again, it just doesn't make any sense. If the electron's spinning this way or the electron spinning this way around an atom, it's not going to change the, the dipoleness. The only way you can change, you can create dipoleness, is it has to stop somewhere. <laughs> If it's a, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's the only way it can work. Pole loads simply the opposite direction, and the idea of this motion is really convenient. Um, so when we get all these domains having their own magnetic spin, we create a permanent magnet if all those domains share each other's magnetic spin. <laughs> so this is the part where they don't have any way to add up, you know, to make at little atoms turn into, a li you know, little magnets turn into big magnets, because they don't have any theory of how the force moves through the magnet. Um, and so they just don't have any, they don't have any way to explain to you why they add up. They just do. Where, if you understand what I've pointed out about electrons and protons, you can understand that the the one force is going to have this tendency um, uh, over time to move 
in one direction and a, and a tendency for the opposite to move in the opposite direction. But you have to understand. You have to understand there's two forces involved. If you don't understand there's two forces, there's no way you can make attraction and repulsion, and there's no you can't make the two different and opposite reactions. You have to have something to react to oppositely. <laughs> If there's only one thing, you can't oppositely react. You need two things so you can oppositely react. They can't interact. And we wind up with an object that is so not magnetic. However, if each of these domains shares its spin with the other domains around it, then we wind up with a permanent magnet. So we're all in this space pointing in this direction. And it's the atoms that have to do magnet. the pointing. If the atoms don't line up, the domains can't line up. Okay. So it starts with the atoms and you just didn't admit that that's, you have to start with that. That's where you Is create the dipole. we're going to talk about for creating a permanent magnet. The first one you just saw. Violent vibrations in the presence of magnetic field. Violent vibrations in a magnetic field. So that's just basically saying first you have to make the uh, little bits mobile, okay, by creating heat, you know, by making the atoms capable of uh, falling or stopping in a new position. So first you have to grease them, so to speak. So you could say lubricate them so they can move. They can't move when it's cold. They can only move when it's warm. So when it's warm, they have freedom of movement. And then they can be frozen in a certain position once they're free to move. And then so if you, you first lubricate them, make them move, and then you put them in the presence of a magnetic field, well, then they'll all line up and stay in one place and move a lot less. And as you cool it, they're moving less and less and less and less, and they'll stay in one position. So they'll end up lining up. And that's how you freeze yourself a magnet. All right, so we got another way to give an object kinetic energy, other than just smacking it around. Um, obviously electricity, but it's not going to be the same theory. It's going to be a different mechanism of you're not liberating the a atoms. You're overtly um, pressurizing them. No. However... Changing their internal shape. When you give love and intention, what's it going to have for feeling? Come on, run with your analogy here. Nothing. It's gonna have a warm, fuzzy feeling, right? Maybe he's tutoring somebody or something. I don't know. This is like a tutoring course or something. I don't know. Heat. Okay. So the next option is to heat it up. So extreme heating in the presence of a magnetic field. Heating in a magnetic field. <clears throat> Again, giving it enough kinetic energy that the domains can shift. What? No, shifting the domains so they can re-harden in a new position. So he sort of said that backwards. You're just lubricating them so they can be frozen in a new position. Lastly, you just leave one in a, in a uh, magnetic field for enough time, and it's just gonna die. Gonna kind of happen. So long durations, long durations of time. You can slowly, <clears throat> very slowly move. So obviously, because there's no lubricant, so it's slow because it has to slowly, inch by inch by inch, um, move. You know, it's like the wind can blow something across the yard, or you can just push it, you know. Of time in a magnetic field. So the first permanent magnets in human history were what we called lodestones, uh, largely found by the Chinese. 
Um, they were basically uh, rocks with some iron ore in them that they found to have magnetic properties. Uh, they had turned into magnets simply because they sat in Earth's magnetic field for long enough in a specific direction or orientation that they gained magnetic fields. I think that might be one theory. I think actually they were molten in the magnetic field and then froze, you know, hardened in the magnetic field and therefore became magnetic and then were broken through glacier activity and whatnot into smaller rocks. Um, if you go to lava flows, uh, where you find uh, that the rock has cooled, compasses don't work there so well because they just kind of want to point at the ground because the ground is a giant magnet because of all the iron ore in uh, the magma, magma, or sorry, the lava rock. Yeah, that doesn't entirely make sense. Um, just because why would it point always down? You know, uh, then the magnets would have to have a, a south polarity pointing up. I mean, the reason why it points down when you align up with the magnetic field is because the magnets want to attract, you know. So, I mean, they don't... S field lines are because you're forcing the compass to stay out here. If the compass was a big enough magnet, it would slide right into the other magnet. The compass really is slowly being pushed towards the magnet. It's just in the iron filings want to go to the magnet. They're stuck on the paper. It's the problem. Friction. Friction stopping them from just going to the magnet. <clears throat> and the fact that the paper is often above the magnet or um, yeah, below the magnet. You know, the paper's over the magnet. The filings can't get to the magnet. And to get to the magnet, they have to go through the paper, and they can't get through the paper. If you do it in fluid, you won't see the field lines. You'll see all the little filings that just pile up on the magnet especially the two at polar ends. <laughs> um, <clears throat> looking at this list of things, what do you notice as a trend? They all need to be in the presence of a magnetic field, which begs what question? Where does that field come from? The Earth. Okay? Loosely. Well, we know the principle. The principle is you can make a magnet by aligning the atoms. And so you can align the atoms either by passing electricity through a magnet or by um, uh, putting it in a magnetic field. So, yeah, done. You looked like you had another answer there. So, Earth's magnetic field. That's our whole next section here. So, geomagnetism. All right. So, see, this was titled Permanent Magnetism, and he really didn't explain the function of a magnet. He's just now moving on again to more effects, not really causes. And so, geomagnetism just gets into now. He's going to start talking about eddy currents, so to speak, inside of the core of the Earth somehow generating you know the magnetic field um, but it's sort of known that the magnetic field isn't um, manifest from the core so so it's really manifested in the the metal in the you know crust of the earth but anyway all right so we go ahead and draw our earth here by our Earth, I totally mean donut. All right, so I don't know if this is really worth it. So I don't know if we'll see. he's just talking about the center of the Earth versus the outside of the Earth. And here you can, well, I just clip on this, and you can see he's drawing these currents where the, these again, assuming that things have to be moving charges. And what he's really saying is these are ions. So that part is correct. He's saying that this stuff getting moved is ionized and the ions move quickly to the surface and so they create electrical potentials and those electrical potentials are essentially what's creating the dipolarity and um, then it gets into a whole conversation about the magnetic poles actually switching which is a whole other 
subject and we've never really witnessed that happening. We just have a lot of circumstantial evidence that indicates it does happen. Um, and it, somehow um, you have to essentially, you know, <laughs> create this, this, anything new being created is going to be changing the polarity. And But you're saying that how much of the earth is, it really has to do with how much of the earth is really hot and therefore it can be changed. See, I mean, the earth doesn't just go from cold crust to incredibly hot core. There's all these layers of it. And so there's whole layers that are kind of liquid, but not, you know, um, moving anywhere, <laughs> you know. And so those are the parts where there's probably a lot of iron, and those atoms can line up <clears throat> to whatever the core is doing. So in a sense, this is a, a phenomenon caused by the core, the switching of the magnetic fields, and it probably just has to do with some procession argument that the swirling inside the core processes. And by processing, it flips. But anyway, I don't, you know, this is a all theoretical crap that doesn't have anything to do with the root function of magnetism, what magnetism is. Again, which I'm arguing, it's just a filter. So he goes into plate tectonics and, uh, you know, the fact that, the, you know, the new crust being formed uh, over time has uh, opposite polarities and that really can only be explained by the magnetic field reversing because you can't really explain how big chunks of the Earth would be the wrong orientation, you know, how they flipped, you know. So anyway, it doesn't really, it's not magnetism. Uh, it's not it's like going from quantum mechanics to the function of galaxies. It's, they're not really the same subject anymore, in my opinion. So he's not really describing permanent magnetism. What, how does a permanent magnet work? It doesn't have a core, it doesn't have a mantle, it doesn't have any of this crap. So this conversation really isn't anything about how a permanent magnet works. Um, so it's enough of a video is what I'm basically saying. I think I've made the point. Um, just wrong. The Maxwell bisecting the two forces, saying there's something called an electric field. There's no electric field. There's only magnetism. There's only charge. So there's only a charge field. When you have it in the form of monopoles, it can cause electricity. When you have it in the form of dipoles, it can cause magnetism. They're not two different things fundamentally different. They're the same thing, just separated by distance, and that's it. Poles separated by distance versus poles not separated by distance. It's just that simple. All right, so till the next time and such. Let's see if we get a response from Sean. I'll post a, I'll post a comment saying I did a response video. We'll see what happens. See if he wishes to defend some of his mushy, right? and he's conceding it's mushy, this concept of spin, <laughs> monopoles spinning, <laughs> you know, somehow creating something by spinning. Uh, no. I mean, something that doesn't have any, something that doesn't have a positive or negative end, how could it possibly matter if it spun? It's the same end all the time, <laughs> you know can't matter. All right. Till next time and such and so forth and whatnot. Thank you very much for your participation. Well, you're not really participating. You're just watching most of you. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I ain't going to thank you for that. Yeah, how about that?